From the world's leading center for finance, the arts, publishing, science, research, media, and innovation, this is Metro Focus. Tonight, the tech economy. What's driving the fast-moving world of startups? It's really clear that we've got the attention of the West Coast. Why is New York's mayor tech's biggest booster? I'm here to pitch you on a once-in-a-lifetime business opportunity. Bridging the digital divide with real-world job training. And of course, you do not want to touch the memory chips. Where tech got its start. For the better part of a century, New Jersey was the center of innovation. And the tech wizards of the future take flight. Corporate funding of Metro Focus is made possible by Mutual of America, your retirement company. Support for this program is made possible by James and Merrill Tisch, Cheryl and Philip Milstein family, Judy and Josh Weston, John and Jody Arnhold, Jean and Ralph Baruch, the Shelley and Donald Rubin Foundation, and the Metropolitan Media Fund. Hello, I'm Raphael Piromont. Welcome to Metro Focus. Tonight, our focus is the tech economy. It's the talk of the town, and it's driving an economic boom. From multi-million dollar public companies to tiny startups, New York is challenging California Silicon Valley for tech supremacy. And leading the charge, New York's own Mayor Michael Bloomberg. Hi, I'm Mayor Michael Bloomberg, and I'm here to pitch you on a once in a lifetime business opportunity. <laughs> The city is sponsoring marketing campaigns, bankrolling organizations that set startups in motion, and making sure that companies stay put right here in New York. Take a look inside a few of the tech companies. In Soho, OMG Pop, a big time game maker that invented Draw Something, was recently gobbled up by Zynga, a San Francisco tech giant and maker of Farmville. The much smaller Harvest, an online service that tracks hours and creates invoices, started with two friends and two IKEA desks and now has more than 30 employees. And in the Flatiron District is the born in New York social media blogging site, Tumblr, which is valued at more than $100 million and is generating billions of page views. It's really clear that we've got the attention of the West Coast. Investors who were not only ambivalent, they, they just didn't realize there was anything going on out here, now make regular trips, often for board meetings and things out here and end up spending a week to just meet with other interesting New York startups to see what's going on. So how will New York, or as some like to call it, Silicon Alley, ever become the center of the tech economy? In a word, with money. The New York Times' Joshua Brustein reports on this East versus West competition. There is no place like Silicon Valley. I think it's absolutely unique. The spirit of entrepreneurship here is, people like to joke it's in the water, it's in the air. I would even say it's in the weather. This is such a sunny, optimistic place. I have not seen anywhere else in the world that builds true global franchises, technology-based franchises like this place does. For technology, the place to be has always been Northern California. But changes in the industry have allowed New York to build a scene that is increasingly tempting. When we were starting our company in, in 2005 uh, and we went to Seattle, we could not even see another company that was doing what we were trying to do, right? Versus in Silicon Valley, we could. We could see lots of companies that we could just kind of emulate the, okay, this is how you raise the money, here's how you build a team, et cetera. And so that was why we chose to come here. But I think now in 2012, the justification for doing that might be less than, than it was before. It might be that five years ago, 10 years ago, three years ago, two years ago, starting a tech company in New York was absolutely insane. But last year, Mr. Harris did just that. Companies are increasingly mixing tech with media, or fashion, or finance. And some startups now say that the West Coast seems a little far away from the action. The internet is going to you know, disrupt and change and influence all these other industries. So for example, with Branch, we want to be a tool for publishers. Uh, and we want to work with writers and bloggers and journalists and media companies. And in San Francisco, there's just nothing but tech. What San Francisco does have, though, is engineers, something no tech company can live without. Hiring was Mr. Harris's main worry when he moved to New York, but the city has actually turned out to be a draw. When we find someone we want, we get them, right? Because not only can we sell a really amazing company, we can sell New York. Would you rather be in, in Mountain View, um, which is a lot of great stuff going for it, but not exactly a lot of fun, um, <laughs> or do you want to be in the greatest city in the world? Now, Mr. Harris does recognize the Valley's unique charms. 
He just thinks New York has its own. There's a lot of uh, energy there that is just awesome to feel. But then again, New York's got a pretty great energy itself. It's a little differently focused, but if you can tap into that energy, it's something that really can give you that push. Have we reached the goodness of the valley yet and, and its, uh, I guess, ability to foster innovation and huge companies? Not yet. We're not there yet, but we're gaining a lot of ground. New York is in no way threatening to overtake California. But even Silicon Valley's biggest boosters are taking note of the city's tech boom. New York is uh, certainly doing a lot of things right, um, just in terms of developing that startup culture. Um, because you, you, need that, you need a history of decades for this to really work. You need examples that other people can follow. Measuring California versus New York in actual dollars gives the East an edge in several respects. The Center for an Urban Future's recent study, New Tech City, found a 32% increase in venture capital investments here between 2007 and 2011, while investment in Silicon Valley companies dropped 10% over the same period. And using a different measure, almost every tech company on the city's mapped in New York project is looking for highly skilled programmers, designers, and engineers. So how will New York support this growing economy? One of the biggest down payments on New York's tech future is a $100 million investment the city is making in a massive new campus on Roosevelt Island. Unveiled last year in this architect's rendering, the winners of the competition for the city's prize of funding as well as city land are Cornell University and Technion Israel Institute of Technology. But in typical New York fashion, there's no waiting around for new classrooms. Instead, Google will host the first Cornell NYC Tech Campus students starting this fall, and where else? Google's New York offices. A few years ago, New York City's tech sector was barely on anybody's radar screen, if you remember. But t fast forward to today, uh, thanks to Google and uh, to others, it's also and also our homegrown uh, hometown tech firms. Tech employment has grown by 30 percent in our city, and today we're second only to Silicon Valley as a tech center, and we don't like to be second to anybody. <laughs> The Roosevelt Island Tech Campus isn't slated to be ready until 2017, but Google says the free lease on the 22,000 square feet it's giving Cornell is good until the campus is ready. Google came to New York in 2006, and just two years ago, it expanded its office here to an entire building in Chelsea. As Rick Carr, host of the program NYC 2.0 reports, when it comes to signs that tech is big in New York, it really doesn't get any bigger than Google. Google's offices here are so big, employees get around on scooters. They work across several floors, and they can skip waiting for the elevator if they want. And they're spread across acres of cubicles. This is the company's second largest office. The only one that's bigger is its Silicon Valley headquarters. It boasts a lot of the amenities of a California tech giant's offices. Food stations where employees can load up on snacks and coffee, and first aid stations for ailing computers. Employees can bring their best friends to work. And of course, there are lots of toys to play with. Google employees could get the same perks in California. So why opt to work in crowded, crazy New York City? Google Docs product manager Jeff Harris says in his case, it's precisely because the city's crowded and crazy. That's actually interesting. I started in California my first year, and then um, I just thought New York was a little more lively. Every time I visited here, I was amazed at all the stuff going on, so I decided I wanted to move out here and I joined this team. Here in New York, I have a less than 10 minute walk to get to the office, which is amazing. The Google Docs team that Harris runs, which is responsible for the company's online word processor, spreadsheet, and so on, is unique within the company. It's based entirely in New York City. Harris says that in part, that's because the idea was born here. It actually started because we acquired a small company that was just a four-person startup based in New York, and we grew the team here. They were really, really talented. They built our spreadsheets app, and then they just kept on building, and they built the document editor, and they just ended up building up the whole suite. Is there something that characterizes New York's technology scene that makes it different from what goes on out in California? 
I think there is. The New York tech scene is a lot scrappier. So because it, they're, we're competing with a whole bunch of other industries, it's not like you meet everyone um, and they're all working in technology. So you have a lot of people that are just making these small startups that kind of have to prove that they're sustainable in a way that in Silicon Valley, it's nothing special if you're working in a startup in New York. That's kind of a big deal because you're, you're just kind of standing out. And with me now is tech reporter Rick Carr. Rick, welcome. Great to be now, here. Rick, this amazing explosion of the tech economy really is happening here. Yeah. Why? Um, a lot of the new technology that's being developed has come to New York f for two big reasons. One is that a lot of these technologies deal with media. They deal with video, they deal with film, they deal with music. The headquarters of those industries are here. They want to be close to the people who run those industries in order to make deals with them, show the technologies to them. The other big answer is Madison Avenue. A lot of new technology that's being developed in the city is advertising driven. They want to be close to the advertising agencies that make decisions about how their clients are spending money. They want to tie the technology into marketing, so it makes a lot of sense. The third big reason, though, is the reason why so many of us are here in New York. People just love to live in this city. I mean, the guys at Google who are here, some of whom have come from Silicon Valley, said, I didn't want to live in a suburban tract house. I wanted to live in a brownstone. I wanted to be able to walk to work. I wanted to have a city that was awake and alive when I got out of the office. I get all that, but why are they willing to incur the high cost of living and the high cost of doing business here? You know, it's not that much more expensive than Silicon Valley. Uh, you look at San Francisco right now, rents in San Francisco are arguably worse than they are in Manhattan. Really? And across the whole peninsula in the Bay Area, it's incredibly expensive out there. So it's, it's not that big a deal for them. So, you know, you know this industry inside out. What is the coolest thing you've seen in the course of your reporting? I would have to say that it's the, the kind of the crazy New York individuals, the crazy originals in this city who are doing technology on their own, building stuff like there's a guy in Brooklyn who I met who's building a one-eighth scale model of a 70s vintage supercomputer that he could put on a table. There's another guy who we met down at SVA who built uh, an imaginary marching band. Basically, you've heard of air guitar. He built an air trumpet that you can actually play using technology. It's just the kind of thing that makes this city great is people who are just saying, I want to learn how to do this, I'm going to do it, and they build it, and it's, it's incredible stuff. Oh, Rick, thanks so much. It's my pleasure. The best thing about what's going on right now is just this, just so much creativity and so much, um, so much hope. The tech economy's promise for the region, according to its boosters, is not just about money, it's also about jobs. But for many people, the jobs seem out of reach, far across what's called a digital divide. In the 90s, the term meant the gap between those who could afford computers and everyone else. Now there are cheap laptops and smartphones, but what's missing for many job seekers is a way to learn the skills needed for even an entry-level job with computers. In the South Bronx, a private public nonprofit called Perscolas pays the way for hundreds of low-income high school graduates to get a start in the tech economy. You put that printed together from scratch. Anatasha Ali and the other students at Perscolas are learning about computers from the ground up. And of course, you do not want to touch the memory chips, right, which are on the front panel. How to take them apart and put them together, repair them, set up networks, the kind of skills you need to get a job in a corporate IT department. They're kind of opening doors for me, so that's really why I'm at Perscolas too, for the job that I want. Ali, who had a baby right after graduating from high school, was interested in computers but didn't have the skills to get a job in the tech sector, an area she knows is growing. Technology is always upgrading every year, so you never know what's coming next. Perscolas provides job training for free to unemployed and low-income adults with a high school degree using funds from foundations, corporations, and state and city governments. The program itself is 15 weeks long. The cost for us is about $5,000 an individual, so when we raise the money for that individual, we want to make sure that they're ready for this experience. There's been a lot of talk lately about uh, the growth in uh, the tech economy in New York City. How has that affected Perscolas? I believe the jobs are there. Everything that we do in this program is based on the feedback we get from the employer community, and that's why I believe we're as successful as we are. A user reports that their computer is very loud. I was in the medical field for a long time, I think for about 18 years. And then um, I got laid off. Like many fellow students, Joel Ramos is trying to make a transition from a dead-end job to a growing field. This place not only gets you certified, the IT part, but it also takes care of 
how to talk, how to deal with resumes, how to have interviews. Though it's a small program, Per Scholars has achieved a high degree of success. We've trained in total about 3,700 individuals. We are now training about 450 people a year. We graduate at 85% and we place 85% of all of our graduates. Per Scholars has placed its students in corporate IT departments all over New York with average starting salaries of $27,000 and the potential for growth. I hope to have a good job and, and do the best I can for my son. A lot of people are discouraged from new technology and trying to keep up with the times. Just give it a try. You never know what you could do. Full disclosure, after we began our reporting on Perscolas, we discovered we have several graduates of the program working right here at 13. So how does the tech economy benefit New York and what's next? Joining us now, Seth Pinsky, president of the New York City Economic Development Corporation, a nonprofit that manages city properties, develops public-private partnerships, and works to bring investment and new business to New York City. Mr. Pinsky, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here with us. Thank you. Mayor Bloomberg has long argued that New York City's economy is too dependent on Wall Street and needs to diversify. Has the city found its firewall against Wall Street's boom and bust cycle in the tech economy? It's important, I think, to, to make two comments in response to that question. Uh, first is, uh, one thing that I think is misunderstood um, about the mayor's statement uh, about the importance of diversifying the economy is that the goal of the administration is certainly not to shrink the importance of Wall Street, sure. it's to grow other sectors. Of course. The second point I would make is that uh, the mayor said from the first day that he came into office that uh, we needed to ensure that we weren't too reliant on any single um, industry. And in fact, if you look uh, in 2007 at the peak of the market, Wall Street accounted for somewhere around 7 or 8 percent of total private sector employment and around 34 percent of private sector payroll. Um, and so what the mayor has been pushing the administration and his economic development officials to do is to find other industries that we can grow. Uh, over the first part of the mayor's administration, we were very successful growing uh, sectors like tourism, uh, growing sectors like film and television production. Um, but what we realized with the crash of Lehman Brothers was that we needed to redouble our efforts. And that's really where our focus on entrepreneurship in the technology sector came from. The tech economy in the city back in the 90s was hit hard when the dot-com bubble burst in 2000. How do we know that this tech economy isn't going to be heading in the same direction? Right now we're going through a very strong period of growth. We need to expect that there are going to be declines, um, but our expectation is that over the long term, the trend will be a positive one. Whereas in the past, technology was really focused on hardware um, and uh, pure technological innovation. Increasingly, what we're seeing um, is the growth of something that we call dash tech, whether it's fashion tech, media tech, finance tech. And New York is really the center of almost everything that comes to the left side of the dash. Mm -hmm. um, and it increasingly is an important player in, in the right side of the dash, the technology sector. The second reason why we think that this time is going to be different is uh, the growth of, of what we refer to as anchor institutions. Um, those anchor institutions are, for example, our academic institutions, which are making very significant investments uh, in growth here in the city, including several new entrants like NYU's Center for Urban Science and Progress in downtown Brooklyn, which was recently announced by the mayor, as well as Roosevelt Island, the, the campus that Cornell and the Technion Cornell are building. Cornell NYC Tech. Absolutely. You've said that the Cornell NYC Tech campus, that's the official name, um, is an Erie Canal moment for the city. What did you mean? Well, if you look back uh, in the 19th century, uh, there was a decision made by then the state of New York uh, to invest in something that many people thought was um, a complete folly, which was uh, the digging of the Erie Canal. And as it turned out, uh, when the Erie Canal opened, it really secured New York City's place for generations to come as first a uh, center of port commerce, and then as a center of industry, and later as a center of services as well. And if you look back through the economic history of the city, that moment where New York really took a quantum leap um, uh, past its competitors on the East Coast was with the opening of the Erie Canal. And our feeling is that the investments that we're making today in these anchor institutions, um, in things like the Cornell and Technion campus on Roosevelt Island um, is a similar investment made by the, the public sector along with the private sector that's going to lead to a sea change in the city's economy for many, many years to come. Well, Mr. Pinsky, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. There are firms on Long Island that are making money off producing 
the technology, the hardware, and the software. So Long Island has benefited even as the, the uh, number of people employed by Wall Street has shrunk. Not only is New York investing heavily in tech here in the city, upstate New York is already heavily invested in technology. The multi-billion dollar nanotech science complex, which is part of the State University of New York's College of Nanoscale Science and Engineering in Albany, already employs 2,700 people. President Barack Obama's recent visit there focused attention on the economic benefits of combining universities and private businesses looking for the next tech breakthrough. WMHT's Marie Cusick has the story. President Obama has become a familiar sight in the Albany area. Hello, New York! The president took a tour and gave a speech at the University at Albany's College of Nanoscale Science and Engineering. It's a multi-billion dollar facility that doubles as both a school and a cutting-edge research center for nanotechnology, the science behind many high-tech electronics and computer chips. Got some of the best workers in the world? You got an outstanding university. Now I want what's happening in Albany to happen all across the country, places like Cleveland, and Pittsburgh, and Raleigh. The school is known locally as the Nano College, and it was set up about a decade ago as a public-private partnership. Nearly 2,700 people work here with hundreds of companies as part of a consortium that includes some of the biggest names in the computing world, like Intel and IBM. The president gave his remarks here in the college's latest clean room. It's still under construction and set to open at the end of the year. It will employ another thousand people who will be building the latest generation of computer chips. Right now, some of the most advanced manufacturing work in America is being done right here in upstate New York. Cutting edge businesses from all over the world are deciding to build here and hire here. Employees say the president's visit is an affirmation of the school's success. James Laramie works here as a programmer. It's a sign of what the economics of can do for both uh, government and industry working together. I think that's a, this is a great sign of it. Kimberly Warby grew up in the Albany area and got a job as a financial manager here three years ago. I know a lot of people that have unfortunately moved out of the area due to the lack of jobs and now I believe this is going to keep some people at least in the science and support fields here for a long time. Like New York City's tech campus, Albany's nanotech complex is a public-private partnership designed to foster innovation. The long history of tech innovation here in the region goes back to a different era. In the 1940s, it was a monopoly, AT&T's Bell Labs, that dominated the tech world. NJ Today Managing Editor Mike Schneider has the story of the Garden State's contribution to today's tech economy in this interview with John Gertner, author of The Idea Factory, A History of New Jersey's Bell Labs. This tiny metal cylinder, three quarters of an inch long, is a transistor. Bell Labs hit its heyday right after World War II. The big invention that really got it up to speed was the transistor in 1947. A device, small indeed in comparison with this vacuum tube, yet capable of taking over its work. And that's really the building block of all digital products in contemporary life. It was attached to the monopoly, AT&T in those days, so it had this huge stream of money that, were, that was flowing. So it could hire the best people, build the best facilities. It could really think long term towards innovations that sometimes took a decade or two decades to develop. New Jersey, of course, during the era of Edison became, I guess, was ground zero for a lot of technological and, and development and inventions, outright inventions as well. Was there anything specific about the Garden State that made people or made this company want to be here? You know, it, it's amazing because we think of California and Silicon Valley as synonymous with innovation, but uh, really for the better part of a century, New Jersey was the center of innovation. So they were strictly employees of a, of a monopoly at that time, being paid as regular employees. There was no bonus, there was no incentive, there was no huge stock incentive. There might be something we could call the competition myth. We think of competition as creating innovation, and to some extent that's true. We have a lot of competition now. We get companies competing, Apple, Google, Intel. But in this era of no competition, this one lab, uh, where a lot of the people working there just sort of invented out of sheer curiosity, um, turned out invention after invention that so, changed the world. So Apple and Google are kind of the heirs to the Bell Labs? I think so in some ways. Um, it's a different time frame now. It was incredibly valuable to have an organization that could think so long term that 
uh, whatever the problems might be with monopolies for consumers, that having this company, this organization that could create platforms for new technologies, new industries, uh, millions of jobs literally, was quite invaluable. And maybe that long-term thinking um, needs to be coming to come back in some ways. I think it's, it's a nice balance for the sort of short-term high metabolism, high-speed innovation we have right now. John Gertner, thank you for coming in. Thanks for having me. No matter how you look at it, the, the, uh, the industry is constantly changing and to be adapting to it is always a challenge. And finally, a look at tech's future. At the World Science Festival this year, an event held throughout the city featuring Nobel Prize winners, films, research breakthroughs and exhibitions, one event caught our eye. Brooklyn's Metro Tech Center at NYU's Polytechnic Institute became Innovation Square for a day, a wildly wonderful display of what's out there on the high-tech frontier. For example, a robotic snake, actually a slithering robot designed to navigate tight spots and search and rescue missions, soccer playing robots, high-tech robotics in action, and our favorite, the Smart Bird, an ultra-lightweight robot that flaps its wings and flies. Fun to watch and imagine the potential uses. And there's a lot more to see and learn online at worldsciencefestival.org. Who knows where tech will take us next. And that's it for this edition of Metro Focus. Please visit us on our website at metrofocus.org for more interviews, additional reporting, and news from our many partners throughout the region. I'm Rafael Piermont. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Corporate funding of Metro Focus is made possible by Mutual of America, your retirement company. Support for this program is made possible by James and Merrill Tisch, Cheryl and Philip Milstein family, Judy and Josh Weston, John and Jody Arnhold, Jean and Ralph Baruch, the Shelley and Donald Rubin Foundation, and the Metropolitan Media Fund.